LED walls are an incredible tool for churches. Not only can you throw content on them like videos or lyrics for worship, but they also function as a major part of your stage design for worship. And you can instantly change the look of your stage within seconds. But LED walls can be kind of intimidating. If you're looking at getting one for the first time, there's lots of jargon surrounding them and it can just be an overwhelming process. But fortunately, I have my friend Barry here from Thor. They're actually the sponsor of this video. And together, we're going to walk you through what I want to be the ultimate guide to LED walls for churches. First, we're going to cover the anatomy of LED walls, how all the hardware and software work together uh, to, to make it all happen. Then we're going to walk through just strategy concerning LED walls, how to make sure you incorporate them well with your existing lighting design, how you take into account things like ambient light coming in through the windows within your worship center. Finally, we'll talk about things like maintenance and really just having a headache free way to make sure the LED wall is always functioning at its best. So I'm really excited to have you here with us, Barry. Yeah, thanks so much for having us, man. Uh, what you guys do with Churchfront is a really big deal and we're really pumped to be a part of just the educational side of this that's a that's at the heart of who we are at Thor not only are we making audio and video products but we want to make sure that the church and the clients are educated on how to use it and that they're choosing the right tool for the job that's ultimately what we want so we're really pumped to be here and being a part of this video so thank you well without further ado let's head on over to the stage take a look at the panels and walk them through the overall infrastructure of how this all works. So let's head on over, guys. So we're here at First Baptist Orlando, and this auditorium, I think, holds around 4,500 people. Yeah, that's uh, it's a big be room. Beautiful space. I've been here for uh, conferences before, um, and I just, I just love, I love also, I just want to point this out, you got an LED wall, but then you have an organ in the same space, yeah, right? Yeah. So it's, uh, LED walls don't necessarily have to be for just the black box, super modern looking right. churches. They can actually be applied to different contexts. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it's not only for the contemporary vibe places. So this has to be one of the widest LED walls I've ever seen. It's Probably the widest I've seen in a church. So what, yeah. what are the specs of, of what we're looking at here? Yeah, basically 44 panels wide six tall, you're 72 feet by 10 feet, and the weight is uh, multiple tons. We're uh, almost almost 8,000 pounds for this wall. It is literally a ton of LED panels, yeah. actually more than a ton of LED panels. So speak to the customization of the layout of panels, because I've seen them in all different shapes and sizes. Yeah, well that's like what you see here is this really large kind of stretched out thing, but with LED it's it is a Lego display. You can build it and do anything you want with it. So whatever kind of shape, this one they're doing a large, you know, kind of rectangle that's curved. You can do, I mean, literally anything. If you want to make an LED ceiling and hang it that way, that's a, a whole other thing, but you can do it. If you want to do 16 by nine displays that are just more informational, kind of think of it almost like replacing a projector kind of thing, you could do that. It's a weird hybrid between, again, the content display and lighting yeah. fixture, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly it. It's, it's lighting with video and then you can also do information on it. Yeah, it's just a hybrid technology. So you kind of break your brain a little bit on how to use it because it's not how you would traditionally use displays. And I know that LED walls made a lot more sense to me when I saw the backside of them and you can see how it's all pieced together. So let's head on backstage. We're back here behind the panels. You can see there's all sorts of panels behind here. They are all connected. So Barry, walk us through really the anatomy of what we're looking at here, how this all works. What you're looking at here is a square panel. So every panel here is a square. It's got this device, power data box. So now you can start to see if you look around how many actual panels there are, you just see this all over. So that's typically when you're building an LED wall, you're gonna have some latches and you, you Literally, you're stacking things together, uh, clicking it together to form whatever shape you want. The system as a whole is the display, the panel, and then it's got to attach to something. So in this case, it's a ground stack system. So it's built from the ground up as flying it wasn't an option for this space because they had organ pipes to deal with and a choir loft and baptistry and all that stuff. You're gonna figure out whatever the application is for you to build your wall. So whether that's wall mount, ground stack, flown, whatever you need for your particular venue, you can shape that wall to work for you. Now that the panels are all there, now you've got to get signal to them. 
And we'll, we'll look at processing more later, but essentially your computer, media server or whatever, ProPresenter is running out of your computer into a processor and that runs to the LED wall. And so then from there, it runs in a series down the wall. So that's how the power hooks up. It works the same way as the data did at Daisy Chains. Uh, now, obviously you, you don't, there are limits to how much power and how much data you can push down a line. So that's one of the complex things about designing an LED wall system is figuring out what's my power draw gonna be uh, and making sure you have the power infrastructure in place because it's not just you know one circuit of 120, 20 amp. It's gonna be a lot more than that. And that's why it's probably a good idea, or it is a good idea, when you're considering a large installation like an LED wall like this, maybe not even this big, but working with uh, the right integrator to make sure that you take For care sure. of all of those uh, necessary elements to make sure you have the right power, you've got the right rigging uh, in place. Yep. Um, this is not stuff that, especially with panels and stuff that can really add up to a high value item for safety reasons and also just to keep your investment functioning properly, you gotta do this right. So to sum up, when you're looking at the back of these panels, they're actually pretty simple devices in terms of the pieces. You get the, the panel itself and then you've got the the power and data supply box. Um, so it's not, again, when I came back behind these things for the first time, that looks complicated, but I'm like, oh, yeah. it's, it's really not that complicated. Right, it really isn't. Yeah, and then look at here, there's some blank boxes or blank panels. What, yep. What's going on there? Yeah, so a lot of times when you're building a large stage, there are parts of the LED wall that are gonna be covered and that you're never gonna put content on or people will never see that content. Yeah. So it's kind of a waste of your dollars to throw your money at those electronics. So we created blank faceplates for panels. So it's the exact same chassis as the panel with electronics in it, power data box and modules. It just doesn't have that. It's got just a metal plate. And it's really nice because, like I said, you're able to build your full set. Structural integrity is maintained, but you're saving yourselves a lot of money by not wasting it on those LED panels. Yeah, and we'll cut to the shot on the other side of the stage. You guys can see pretty much the, we're behind the drum set right now. So you can't see, even though it looks like the wall would continue down to the floor, it doesn't need to because you can't see it from out in the audience. There's so many cool just rigging and creative tricks that you can do. Like this ground support system is cool. It, this is, we make the ground support and the wall mount and the fly bars and all that stuff. So when you buy you know, a system from us, you're gonna get everything processing all of that. The hardware itself, uh, can do a lot of things. What you're seeing is kind of a standard curved ground stack system. Uh, I will pause and point out the ballast weight. They spent a lot of money in <laughs> shipping. Uh, there's an equal amount of weight of sand as there is LED. So there's an additional 7,000 pounds of sand back here. Yeah, or yeah, so not, essentially, not yeah, it's not that complicated. The, the hard part, honestly, when you're building a ground stack system like this is leveling. Mm -hmm. uh, the stage is not level, it doesn't matter how much you paid to get a level stage, it's not gonna be. Yeah. Um, so then you have to account for that. And in this case, they're across 72 feet. Oh, so wow. it's actually pretty difficult to get a seamless wall uh, built like that. So mm -hmm. what, what we have is these ground bars, they have leveling feet on them to account for that. Yeah, so the other thing to, to mention on these is that this is the actual curved uh, edition of this panel. So we make a straight or a curving edition. So the wall, can curve plus or minus 10 degrees. Uh, so this is the curving latch that does that. Um, so you can set it, so this would be minus 10 degrees, minus seven and a half, five, two and a half, zero, and then you start going plus. So you can do concave or convex um, with this system, which is really nice. You can do that virtual production style stage where it's just a big wraparound thing. Uh, lots of creative options. So this is a distribution rack, essentially, for the LED wall. In some cases, you actually want your processor where your output of your switcher or media server is gonna hit. You want that physically close to the video source. Um, but your LED wall might be, in this case, a few hundred feet away from that source. So we're using fiber distribution to connect everything. So the processor is back in the rack in video world, which we'll go check out in, in a minute. And then we come over fiber uh, to the distribution box, and then this is what sends the signal to the panels. So the panels are just a series of devices that are connected together like we talked about. So it just jumps from one to the other. So what we're doing is we're running cat out of here into the wall, that's the input, and then it jumps out of the backside of this panel into the input of that panel and then just down the line it goes. So that's how 
data distributions done. So as we're talking through the anatomy of this system, it does get a little complex and hard to sort of grasp and visualize all the pieces working together. So Thor is actually gonna provide for you a free download guide that's gonna show you just a nice little schematic of how these parts uh, all come together. So go ahead and uh, click the link below this video to download that cheat sheet, and I know it's gonna help you guys a ton. So that's the stage, and you saw how those LED panels are rigged on the stage with power and data. Now let's go back to the control room to better understand understand how they're sending content to the wall. We're back here in the server room. They've got all of the brains of their AVL system back here, including the processor, which is yep. right up there. This is the Novastar H5. A uh, really cool system, actually, that lets you, uh, it's modular. It has modular I.O. cards, so input, output. So if you want it to be HDMI, you put the HDMI card in there. If you want 4K, 3G, you know, whatever your flavor, you can do that with these, which is super cool. And then they have a second one as a spare, just in case there's ever an issue. Uh, as you know, things happen, so they have a backup right there. The Nova Star is what's getting fed video from the video switcher, or yep. however they're mixing video, cutting video, and then out of that goes the fiber lines to the distributor that we saw? Yep, you got it. But like we said, in some cases, you might have your SDI video coming into your processor, and then out the back of it could be the Cat5 cables going to the wall itself to, to do that distribution. Yeah. Um, so again, this is a larger scale LED wall setup at a 4,500 seat auditorium, right. um, but this really can scale down to even a smaller uh, space that holds only a few hundred people. Yeah, and, and one, of the, one of the things, like just understand about the scale of this and why they have this processor, because they have that many panels, the actual canvas is over 4K, mm -hmm. so they needed to be able to have essentially two 4K inputs coming into this to feed that wall. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's such a big processor and then just so complicated whenever you get that large scale. One thing I like to relate it to or compare it to is how if you're like a gamer and you're building a custom PC, you gotta have a good graphics card if you're trying to have really great high definition 4K graphics on a large uh, screen in order to tell all of those little pixels what they need to be at, at every precise moment, um, it's just gonna require a lot of uh, computing power to make that happen. So yep. the same way with an LED wall, you gotta have that graphics power to be able to tell all of those humongous, uh, all those pixels on the humongous wall exactly what to do and when. If you're kind of looking into LED, we would strongly recommend that you either look at Novastar processed LED walls, which are the most common, or Brompton. There are other brands of processing platforms, but like you said, it's the central graphics card, essentially, that's running everything. So even if the quality of the hardware of the LED panel is good, if the quality of the graphics card or the processor isn't, uh, your quality of your system is going down dramatically. Does it, could have, does it have an effect on things like the, the color and tone of the image as well? Majorly, yeah. So with each system, what you have to think of is it's not like you can just swap out the graphics card because the panel itself has a receiving card that's built into it that speaks to the language of the processor. So whatever platform you go with is what's in the panel, is what's in the processor. There are things that Novastar can do that Brompton can't. There are things that Brompton can do that Novastar can't. So it's really understanding what's my application and just having an understanding of what those two systems are and how they work. And that's a good reason to just have a conversation with you guys or an integrator to kind of navigate what would work best. Here's the back of it so you guys can see. Those are those fiber lines that went to the uh, distributor that was behind the LED wall on stage. Yep. Yeah, and this is the uh, this is the spare that's really not used, so you can kind of see how things are working. These are the output cards. Yeah. So this one has the 16 ports that you could plug straight into the LED wall if this was located there, but instead they're using fiber, so these have optical or fiber outs. Uh, and then, yeah, they're using, everything's tied in with Genlock, so the cameras stay in sync and you don't have camera issues. And then, uh, yeah, they're using DisplayPort in straight off of their graphics computer. So when we're doing two 4K canvases, it's coming straight off in short video run. So we're in the video control room here, and let's talk about how we're getting content to the processors. Because remember, it starts at a computer creating content, that content gets sent to the processor, and then that gets distributed to the LED wall. So walk us through the various ways that you see this happening in churches. Yeah, so on the content side and how distribution works is gonna be different on different scales. This is a really large scale system, as you can see. And so 
they're not doing the simplified workflow. The typical workflow would be I have ProPresenter running, I've got my lyrics and graphics running off of that, um, and then everything's just running out straight out to the screen or maybe through a switcher or something like that. That's a more standard workflow. You don't have to do anything crazy. Even if you have complicated stage designs with LED, meaning like not just a 16 by nine wall, but we've taken that 16 by nine wall, now we've exploded it out over pieces over the stage and we have it functioning more like a lighting element. In that case, you can still use ProPresenter uh, and you're just gonna maybe grab like content from CMG or something and just scale it out across the, those panels and it's gonna look pretty good. As soon as you really want to get into okay, I want that panel to do this thing, I want that section to do this thing, I want an outline around that one, and a different video source on that one. When you start going down that road, ProPresenter's not gonna cut it anymore. You need to start thinking media server. That can mean a lot of things. There's more lightweight, easy to get to know ones, like Resolume is one that I really like. Super powerful, lots of great layer management, so you can do the things that I was talking about. All right, we wanna, take in some live camera feeds into Resolume and then throw in video effects like black and white and static and then throw that out on this little section of panels. You can do that. Totally, because even the simple concept of saying like, hey, I want to um, play like this announcement video on my LED wall, but instead of just like scaling that video to be the entire wall or like a little portion of it while the rest of the wall is black, I want to be able to say, hey, I want this wall, this video to be superimposed maybe on like a, a some sort of background, like a motion background, yes. right? And like it, maybe there is ways that you can possibly do that with ProPresenter, but it might get a little bit clunky, take too long to set up, or it just might be asking too much of ProPresenter to do that. And that's where I've seen these, these uh, media servers uh, definitely come in handy. And the other thing I would speak to that would definitely be helpful, even in smaller church settings, is having um, potentially like a 2ME video switcher. Um, say you do have ProPresenter with a deck link sending video outputs. Um, it's going to give you plenty of video outputs to work with. So some will be for maybe you know just, just lyrics. Some will be going to your live stream feed. So many different ways you can go about specking this out. And if you're unfamiliar with the concept of an ME, it's a mix effect in a video switcher. You see this big video switcher that's behind me, that's probably four Emmys at least, maybe more, something like that. Essentially, how many independent uh, movies can I cut from this video switcher at, simultaneously so that people can see different content if they're online, if they're in the room, if they're looking at this screen or that screen. You could take the same video input sources and then cut uh, different outputs or program outputs uh, to different destinations. So again, it's a little easy to talk about all this jargon and yeah, stuff. Yeah. Um, and we just wanna make sure you guys do understand just the, the essentials of, of how this infrastructure works together. You know, a really standard LED setup that I would see at at a church that's gonna do a center screen and then they have iMags. You're probably looking at a 3ME switcher at that point because now you've got iMags that are switched independently of the center screen, which is switched independently of broadcast or your online. So, uh, so that's really common. And, and then one of the other cool things that you can do, some, some of the processors that we were looking at have multiple inputs and you can recall presets uh, to reconfigure those multiple inputs different ways. So there are some creative things that you can do to simplify a system. Let's say you have a center screen in your church and 90% of the time for weekends, it's gonna be ProPresenter with lyrics at the top. That's what it is. But during the week, low tech crew, they wanna have a meeting and they wanna throw a laptop up on it. Well, now we need to put a different input up on that screen. So there's some really cool tricks you can do just with a pip to where, hey, I hit preset number two and I get a picture in picture little box of video content coming from a laptop sitting on top of my ProPresenter output. That's a really cool way to use that. And that's something that Novastar does really well is managing multiple inputs. So that concludes this first major portion of understanding LED walls for churches. You've got your computer that is creating the content, that's gonna send the content to the processor, that's gonna distribute the content to the appropriate panels of your LED wall. And then you saw on the LED wall, we had the panels, we had the power and data supply. You saw how it was rigged. It can be rigged from the ground. It can be also hung. Um, you wanna make sure you get that done uh, professionally and safely. So that's the anatomy 
of an LED wall system. So now let's move on to talking more about strategy. We'll cover things like making it work with your lighting system, understanding pixel pitch when you're shopping for an LED wall, and then also just overcoming some of the common challenges people have with getting their cameras to work well with their LED wall. So what are the factors to consider when it comes to lighting design and your LED wall? The main things are, okay, if I'm standing on stage and the cameras are exposed so that I look natural and I look good on camera, is my LED wall too dim or too bright? That's the first thing we have to work on. I've seen a lot of churches struggle with that because yeah. their LED wall is too bright. Yep. And then they try to expose for like us if we were on camera right now. Yep. And then the background is completely blown out. Yeah, right? yeah. I'll, what's crazy is in a venue like this, this large with this much front wash, they're still running their LED wall at 7%. Yeah, so right now, just for to make this video look cooler, uh, it probably looks brighter than it kind of needs to be, yep. uh, but normally they have it at 7% intensity um, to make it balance properly with the exposure yep. on the camera. So it's a very important factor. So when you look at the stage here at First Baptist Orlando, you can see that the LED wall, of course you can put content lyrics there, but this is like a gigantic backwash fixture that can change colors and brightness, and you can you really have a lot of cool effects uh, to adjust the lighting design in the room. So what, if I were to approach this, like getting my LED wall to work along with my lighting fixtures, I, it is kind of as simple as like, okay, what's the content that's going on the wall? What color is it? What different hues of colors are being used? And then how can we use maybe complementary colors or matching colors uh, with our other side wash fixtures, back wash fixtures, etc. You can do some really cool effects with LED. For example, you could turn off front wash uh, and have your LED super bright and then you have this really cool silhouette effect. Uh, there's so many like creative opportunities with LED because it is a lighting fixture with video. Everybody is pretty well aware of the issues that can happen when you're pointing a camera at a screen because you've got frame rates and you get the screen that's refreshing at a certain rate. Yep. You can have some weird issues happening. We already talked about the brightness of your front lights to make sure that the relationship of your subject who's being lit is gonna be balanced well with the brightness of the LED wall. But what are some other lighting and camera considerations that you just have to navigate when you install this type of system? If you have already like your lighting system balance that we've already talked about, the next thing is gonna be color temperature and you want colors to be captured and reproduced accurately. And so the first way to do that is to white balance everything. So typically your cameras should already be white balanced to the front wash color temperature. So whatever your skin tone is, it looks natural in the camera. That's what that's gonna do. But it doesn't only make skin tone look great, it makes the rest of the colors on stage look correct as well. Because um, it's understanding its own reference point of what is white. So that's what the camera is doing. The lights are all dialed, but we also have to think about the LED screen. So if we're capturing an LED screen, we want that color temperature to match what is in real life, which is what's happening from the front wash. So let's say this key light we're using is color temperature, let's say 4,500. Yep. The camera, we told the camera it's 4,500 and then the LED wall, the, is it the processor that you go in there and say the same number usually? Yeah, essentially, yes. Okay. So uh, different systems do it differently. Mm -hmm. uh, both Brompton and Novastar give you the option to select color temp. What's really cool about Brompton is their calibration technology is a little different. Um, I'd say a little bit higher end and more precise. And so you can do some really cool stuff where if you type in the number, that's actually the color temperature. Mm -hmm. Where with Novastar, you kind of have to fiddle with it a little yep. bit, but you can still get it dialed. Ideally, your front wash is gonna have the right color temperature, even just to, to what it looks like in the room, yeah. right? Because usually if you're trying to adjust the color temperature in strange ways with your cameras, that means your front lighting is just not the temperature it should be. Yeah. And then that makes it a little bit more complex, I would imagine, getting your LED wall to look the yeah. way it's supposed to be. Yeah. But you can just adjust the temperature as needed. So we covered issues with brightness between how you light your subject and the LED wall brightness. We talked about color temperature, but there's also other issues with it when you get a camera involved when it comes to like the LED wall might start flickering or you'll yeah. see these like scan lines going on. What's going on? How do you address that? Yeah, so it really comes down to build quality of the panel. Um, there's so many places to 
build in great performance when you're engineering an LED panel. There's a lot of places to cut cost when you're making one. And so having a panel that's built for your application is gonna be what makes it work. LED panels that are indoor, on-camera performance, purpose-built. That's what they're made to do. And so there are very specific hardware things that are very technical, which we can get into if you want, but it, it is things like scan rate, refresh rates, IC drivers, uh, just, we start really just getting into the weeds here on what makes a panel not flicker on camera. But essentially, an LED panel is flickering on and off, and if a camera shutter captures it in the off state, you see flicker. And so there's a lot of tricks to be able to get the camera to not see the LED wall mid-blink. So that's gonna be playing with things like, even down to your camera, playing with frame rates and figuring out or what shutter speed do I need to run at so I'm not capturing in between those blinks, that's one. There's also gen lock, just locking your camera to the wall so it has the same starting point so it understands it's capturing at the beginning of the frame, essentially. There's other really cool features Brompton uh, does, and Novastar is starting to incorporate as well, uh, which is called Shutter Sync, is the Brompton feature. And what that allows you to do is actually change the way that the wall is refreshing to how the camera is doing it, not the other way around. So it gives the camera operator and the artist the tool to say, you, do, you capture how you want, and change the LED wall to work for you versus the other way, which is, this is what the LED wall does. You gotta force your, your gear to make it work. How does a camera with global shutter uh, compare to a rolling shutter in LED walls? Yeah, so global shutter is just known generally as being better for LED. To my understanding, global shutter is capturing like the whole frame Correct. image. Like, you know, instead of having the rolling shutter, which is basically capturing like a portion of it, kind of yep. in a rolling fashion, yep. which can, in introduce those uh, flickering or lines or things like that. Yeah, for sure. Global shutter, you're gonna have a lot less issues capturing LED, it's gonna work a lot better. One of the things that we've done on our panels to help combat that even for a rolling shutter camera is use something called scrambled pulse width modulation. Mm -hmm. And what that does, it's baked into the hardware, it's not a software feature you turn on or off, but it actually randomizes the refresh of the panel mm -hmm. so it doesn't do it in a linear fashion. Mm -hmm. So that way, if you were to capture it on camera, you don't have a big black line going across the wall, it's gonna just be kind of randomized. So it's minimizing the, that, that effect, essentially. Some of the other things to think about, you know, we've done lighting and color balance and wash and all of that. Now it's the actual coloring of the LED this, themselves and how they're reproducing the content that you make. Um, you want your content to look great. Uh, and you can tell when it's not. If your LED panel itself does not reproduce red, green, and blue in a way that is true red, green, and blue, you don't have a good starting point. So to try to make that look natural is very difficult. Mm -hmm. And so when we're manufacturing panels, we're gonna pick the highest quality LED that we can. Now that does mean it costs more. So for somebody who's looking at buying an LED wall, if it's a lot cheaper, there's a really high chance. Like if you're talking a third of the price, this brand versus this one, and we're talking a major price difference, mm -hmm. and it looks on paper like the same thing, probably you're looking at a quality of LED difference, and that's gonna directly result in the quality of your image display. I would compare it to even when you're buying LED lighting fixtures, you have cheap, low CRI fixtures, yep. right? That simply, when I talk about CRI, it's like, how like true t t to light, when we compare this to like the sun, yep. is it in producing, yep the different wavelengths of light, right? And uh, if you don't have all of the proper wavelengths of light, you're just, you're just missing all that data, that information. Yep. Whereas a high-end LED fixture, uh, and I guess, again, remember, this is still, the wall is an LED fixture, right? With yep. all the little diodes. Yep. And I don't know if you guys ever use CRI when you're talking about these pixels, but you want it to be outputting all the data possible so that you can get those subtle uh, differences in hue and saturation and those things that like a, a colorist would think about as they're coloring a, a film um, that you're gonna watch at the movies. Like this is all very subtle stuff that if it's not there, if it's not right, it looks super cheap and none of us really know why. Yeah. Cause we're like, oh, it's green, but there's something off about that green right. or yeah. whatever, right? Yep. Yeah, hundred percent. That And that's, that's the, LED quality versus not quality thing, it really matters. And at the end of the day, like you said, you're very used to seeing your phone. So people look up at a screen that doesn't look right and they just know it's not right. They might not know why, but it's not right. Essentially, I have a display that can show 
exactly what the camera is outputting, that's what you want. Yeah, your creative team at your church making all the videos or short films, they're not gonna be too happy if they work on coloring a film and they put it on the big screen TV for everybody to see and it looks completely yeah, different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now let's talk about pixel pitch. What is it? Why is it important to consider when you're shopping for an LED wall? Yeah, so pixel pitch is the distance. Here, I'll show you. The distance between that pixel and that pixel, how far apart they are. So this one's 3.9 millimeters apart from the middle of that one to the middle of that one. So this is our 3.9 LED wall. So that's the pixel pitch of this wall. Now this matters because you want the wall to not look like a bunch of pixels or LEDs when you look at the screen. Think of like a jumbotron. If you can see all the little lights, it's not, it's not pleasing and that's not what you want in your church. So if you want your screen to look smooth, homogenous, think like a TV or a projector, you're going to select the pixel pitch that at viewing distance, you can't see the little dots anymore essentially. So at 20 feet is typically about where we would recommend 3.9 millimeter being used. So at about 20 feet away, you can no longer see all the little lights. It just looks like a smooth screen. The other consideration with pixel pitch is your camera. How close is my subject that's on camera standing to the LED wall? What you don't want to happen is for the camera to focus on the LED wall and to start to see that grid of pixels, because what happens is it interacts with the grid of pixels in the center of the camera, and you end up with moray. It looks like those kind of wavy, rainbowy lines mm -hmm. on an LED wall. If you've ever seen that, especially if you shoot one from the side, and we'll show that where you can see in this shot right here, that you're looking over from the side and you see those wavy rainbow lines, that's moray. You want to avoid that. And the way that you do that is one, keep the wall out of focus, but two, if you can get a tight enough pixel pitch, the camera is no longer seeing the space between, and so it doesn't have the moray effect. So when you're buying an LED wall, pixel pitch is the first thing that you really have to decide mm -hmm. what's right for me. So what if we do have sufficient distance of, let's say, right, like maybe it's 30 to 40 feet from the front row of the seat to the LED wall. Yep. So we could go with that 3.9 millimeter pixel pitch. But then what if, again, we have cameras like on stage getting like the backline musicians yep. and the LED wall is going to be pretty close. It's always going to be in the background of those shots. Are you saying a 3.9 could still work so long as you have a low aperture and it's blurred out or you just have to be, have your camera operators be mindful? of it, like yeah. what, all of the above? All of the above is really the answer because it doesn't matter how much money you throw at this, if your sensor and the LED wall grid line up wrong, moray happens. It doesn't matter what pixel pitch it is, what kind of processing you have. If it happens, it happens. You just have to learn your tools. What, what are the challenges that I'm gonna have with this wall? Uh, at my church, uh, I had a Thor wall 3.9 at my church and I had to learn how to use it. And from certain camera angles, I knew, hey, if we're gonna be zooming at these, at these focal ranges, we're gonna have moray. So we're gonna pay attention to that and not hang in that zone. Like let's push past that while we're, while we're you know, zooming in or whatever. And then additionally, just move the camera. Sometimes all you literally have to do is move the camera two feet and your moray just went away mm -hmm. because now that's all it needed to get the ball out of focus, mm -hmm. just right. All right, so since you have the panel out, let's uh, go ahead and head on over to the actual wall and talk more about how you got it out uh, yep. off of the wall and a little bit of the servicing that will go into uh, this equipment. So this is the module uh, that has all of the LEDs on it that came off of the, the the LED wall. We design all of the panels to be super serviceable. Uh, one of the things that will happen over time is that you will have an LED go out at some point. There are almost 4 million pixels on this wall. The chance that one of those goes out at some point is high. It's gonna happen. So when it happens, how are you gonna handle it? So we've designed the walls to be super serviceable. Uh, this is just magnetically attached. There's no screws. So essentially, you're gonna just pop the panels in and out as you need to service them. So on the LED screen itself, now that we've put the module back in, if you have that module that needed to be replaced and it needs to be serviced, we've set up just a really quick and easy service system. Basically, you hop on the website, type in the serial number, send it to us, and it's about a two week turnaround and we repair it, send it back, and then you're back up and running. But what we do to make sure you're not down a section is when you buy a wall from Thor, you get spare parts, no charge, and they just live on your shelf. So if you need to swap it, you can. So now that we've talked about the LED module and the maintenance and how that works, the other part is the power data box. So we're gonna go around to the back of the wall and I'll show you that. 
All right, so at the front of the panel, we saw the module. This is the back view of it. Uh, it has a little handle, so when you're pushing it out, you can hold on to it. And then there's a safety clip just to keep everything in place. Again, it's just magnetically held in. They don't fall out, but it's there for safety. Then this is the power data box. And typically, if you're gonna have an issue with your LED wall, it's gonna be a pixel, an LED went out, and that's just a module swap. Or there's something else going on inside the power supply or the receiving card, or there's a port issue, something like that. You would have a spare on hand, and you just swap it out. And the way that you do that, we'll pull power and data, unscrew the four thumb screws that are attaching this box to the back of the wall, and we can pull it off. And then that's the power data box. So. We keep things nice and clean, super simple. Uh, everything is super crazy engineered. All the connectors are straight to the PCB. If you're a nerd, that matters. Well, I love how the on the back side here, like this just magnetically connects to the panel yep. and power. That's why like when you put the panel in, it's just instantly on. Exactly, yep, it just turns on. They're hot swappable. To be able to get to it quickly, that's something that we wanted to build into the panel that you could actually respond and get it done. So, so yeah, they're in the, in the power data box, they're really pretty simple. Like I said, there's a power supply inside, there's a hub board, and then there's a receiving card, which we did talk about the whole Nova Star and Brompton receiving card ecosystem. That's what's in here. And that cat cable connects here, uh, connects to the receiving card. And then, yeah, it goes out to the other panel. So that's, that's just the power data box and putting it back on is just as simple as taking it off. You just push it in place, screw everything in and then power and data and away you go. It'll take a few seconds for everything to power up. And then there's status lights on the back uh, so you can see when you have power and signal. And then there's also a test button, which is convenient whenever you're doing tests or setting up and you wanna just check, uh, say you're setting up and you don't have everything connected to a processor yet, but you wanna see, hey, is my panel working? You can hold the test button down and go through different test patterns, see white, green, red, blue and a few other things. So we saw how simple it is to service these panels if you need to swap one out with a spare, uh, if you need to replace the power data box, but if there's other ma major issues, what's it like as a tech director, worship leader, navigating those uh, just bigger service projects? Yeah, that's a really good question. I know whenever I was a TD buying an LED wall, I was a little bit freaked out. Again, we already, we already covered the maintenance side of things, which mm -hmm. is really just straightforward stuff. Swap a power data box, swap a module, just about anybody can do that. Um, but really, if it gets more complicated than that, that's where it's really important to have somebody to call. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for us, we've partnered with great integrators to be your first line of defense. Because often what we've found with our systems that typically when we get a call, it's actually not an issue with the LED wall. It's usually somewhere else in the system that we're trying to diagnose. Mm -hmm. And so having the integrator who knows how your system's configured and all the just ins and outs and the nuances of all that can help diagnose issues quick, quicker. If there is an issue with LED, your dealer's gonna take care of you. And then if there's an issue that they can't, they're gonna reach out to us and then we're gonna get you squared away. Just restart ProPresenter, it'll yeah. probably work. We covered a lot in this video. That's why I really wanna encourage you guys to check out that free guide that Thor put together for you, link down below. And then also you can check out the Thor website because you guys have various different products available between panels, especially in the different sizes. Yeah, check out the website. You can see those different panel sizes and products that we make. And in addition to that, we have a lot of resources. Again, education is a big deal for us. And this complex topic of LED, how does it all work? What matters, what doesn't? What am I looking at on a spec sheet? Things like that. We've covered a lot of that. We have resources posts on our website. And if you have any questions, hit us up. We're super, super happy to help. Thank you so much, Barry, and the rest of the team at Thor for walking us through the, the fundamentals of understanding LED walls for a church environment. If you guys really wanna take it to the next level, I encourage you, go subscribe to their YouTube channel, check out the free resources that they got. Uh, I'm gonna link that all below in the description of this video. If you found this video helpful, please share it with your friends in worship and production ministry so they can benefit from it as well. And of course, hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you guys next time.